Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. When the Arctic Ocean no longer has sea ice, when it's an open ocean, and this will probably happen for the first time uh, at the in a September, I'm guessing, educated guess by 2022, who knows for sure, then the Arctic will be profoundly different. For example, very large waves will be able to build up in the Arctic, and these waves will erode coastal shorelines, releasing, which are a lot, contain a lot of permafrost. So it'll thaw out the permafrost, and the bacteria will start breaking apart the organic matter in the permafrost, releasing carbon dioxide and methane, depending on whether oxygen is available, that would be carbon dioxide, and in the absence of oxygen, so in, in, under the water, for example, a few feet of water even, it will be methane. These waves will also mechanically erode the base of the ice uh, on Greenland. So this, those big huge ice shells uh, that are, you know, is over a hundred meters high will, will become unstable from the wave action and uh, will, there will be tremendous calving. So the melt rate of Greenland will obviously increase significantly. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So right now we're, I'll continue with my last, on my last video and talk about the, the uh, waves. So the ocean, the, the wave equation, whether it be for ocean waves or any other waves is here. So basically, the the energy in the wave is the density times gravity gravitational acceleration times a squared over two a is the amplitude of the wave so if you have a eight meter wave as opposed to a four meter wave there's twice as much energy in the eight meter wave the eight meter wave uh, um, relative to a two meter wave the the amplitude um it's, it's doubled the gain. So it's, um, if, if you have an eight meter versus a two, eight over two is four, four squared is 16 times, 16 times the, um, the, the energy. Okay, so what other implications are there in the Arctic of these large waves? A very significant one is that large waves, the, they transfer some energy downwards. Okay, so there's something called the Ekman spiral. Okay, let's go down here. Okay, so if you have a wind on the surface, then because of the Coriolis force in the northern hemisphere, the surface water doesn't move in that direction. It has a rightward component because of the Coriolis force, 45 degrees. The surface water moves this way. This water will then drag water slightly lower, but that along, but that will be offset, um, offset again by, by a small amount. And then that water will drag water below and that will be offset again. So you get this spiral pattern. And eventually the, uh, the direction of the movement um, is in the opposite direction. So this is known as the Ekman spiral and it carry, it mixes water and moves water down as far as a hundred meters. Okay, now why is this so significant? Oh, and by the way, this is the effect that causes tremendous upwelling on coasts. If this is a coastline and you have a wind coming this way in the northern hemisphere, the Ekman spiral, spiral, spiral will mean that the, there's a component of water that is moving away from the coast here. Okay, so the surface water that moves away from the coast would lower the surface level and then something has to replace it. So water would be upwelled here to replace it. So this upwelling, this is where all the nutrients are down below. So this water carried up and across uh, has, brings the nutrients that are required for phytoplankton growth and then 
the um, zooplankton eat the phytoplankton and all the way up the food chain. So, so this is a, a coastline that will have, have incredible fishing, um, you know, and, and, and whereas if the wind's going the other way, then you don't get this upwelling effect. Now, why is the Ekman spiral so important down to affecting the water down to 100 meters? Well, here's the reason why. Okay, in this recent paper coming out at the end of August, this is the CBC report on it, there's a warm water pocket 50 meters below the Canada Basin. And if that warm water, if the energy from that warm water went up to the surface, that would completely melt out the ice. Okay, so this study was published in Science Advances, researchers from Yale and Woods Hole. They looked at the Canada Basin over the last 30 years. Okay, so here's, the, here's Canada, Alaska, Russia. Here's the Canada Basin. This is 2014 to 2017 average. And you can see that this is the amount of the heat content of the water 50 meters down, warm layer. Um, and you can see that it's, it's actually it's significant. There's significant heat under the ice layer. Okay, now the reason why the warm, wa warm water typically floats, but this is salty water. So the warm salty water is denser. The water at the surface, um, you have the ice, and then the ice melt is fresh water underneath. So you've got a sort of a lens, and then you've got this, this, uh, all this heat trapped, and it stays down because it's saltier. Okay, um, the amount of heat in this warm layer has doubled over the past 30 years. Okay, uh, how does the warm water get there? It's coming from the edges of the basin, like the northern Chukchi Sea. Um, it could be coming from the Atlantic side, warm water coming in. Okay, and so this heat isn't going, isn't, isn't going to go away anywhere. Eventually it's going to come up to the surface and it's going to impact the ice. And when there's no ice, then of course all of that heat can just come up. And one of the mechanisms that it's mixed is by the Ekman spiral, which operates down to about 100 meters. Okay, so that's a key uh, factor. Uh, something else with the wind circulation in the Arctic. And I've ex so I've just Googled, okay, wind circulation in Arctic and scrolled down to, to this image and clicked on this image. And this is what we have. Okay, so this looks a little bit complicated, but bear with me and I'll explain what's going on. So this is very, very cold area. Okay, so the air is very dense. Okay, it sits down on the ice, it's a high pressure, and it goes to low pressure areas and it's deflected to the right by the Coriolis force. So it forms this Beaufort gyre some of this uh, wind spins off and forms the transpolar current, which comes out here. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism of the winds. And you have these other, you have these ocean currents coming in, the, the uh, red. But, oh, but these are the wind, and of course they drag the ice. So the ice movement, while there is sea ice, it moves in, uh, like this. Okay, now what will happen when there's no sea ice? Why, you're not going to have this cold pool here. The water will actually be warmer than the land, especially in the fall, as the land is cooling off. So because the air is much warmer here, hot air rises. It creates a low pressure area over the surface. So the high pressure area goes in, deflects to the right, and the, you'll get a switch in direction in the Beaufort gyre. Okay, this is like a monsoonal effect. And the transpolar current, it will drag water this way. So it'll drag water, warm water from the Atlantic Ocean into the Arctic Basin. And all of these things will make sure that the ice starts to disappear for longer and longer durations and eventually year round. Now, of course, that we've got Greenland up here. That'll be the only cold place left. Like I said, the center of Greenland is about 73 degrees north.
that will be the cold center for the jet stream. But also the, the increased wave actions will undercut the glaciers on Greenland. Greenland melt will rocket upward at supralinear levels, supra exponent, super exponential rather, not supra, super exponential. So that if you just Google Greenland melts rates 2018, you can see this is the melt on the surface. Okay, um, one year it went up to almost, uh, you know, over 90%. Um, and mass loss of Greenland is accelerating, it's increasing. Okay, um, here's the change in the ice mass. You can fit an exponential curve down. The doubling period, the rate of ice loss from Greenland, the melt rate, is doubling roughly every seven years or so. Now, Antarctica, of course, what happens to that melt rate? As sea level starts to rise, it will start to float some of these ice shells. Let's have a look here. Okay, so this is melt around um, Antarctica. A lot of West Antarctica is grounded on bedrock that's well below sea level. As sea level rises, it, ri it lifts up the and torques the ice shelves and it will greatly increase sea level rise from like melting from and calving from Antarctica. So if we had a global sea level rise of say, uh, well, I have videos, Google seven meters by 2070, is that possible? Seven meters of sea level rise by 2070. If we did in fact attain that, about half of the of that would be from Greenland and the other half would likely be from Antarctica, primarily West Antarctica. Now, methane, of course, is in abundance in the Arctic, in the, in the permafrost. Okay, it's in the permafrost on the land and it's in the sediments, sea sediments, um, most notably on the Eastern, um, Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, where the water depth is only 50, 50 meters to 100 meters, um, and the bottom surface water temperature has increased, according to Peter Wadhams, as much as five degrees in the last number of years, and that's thawing out the sediments on the ocean floor and um, melting some of the clath rates and releasing methane. So, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, methane isn't really a problem, large methane releases. Well, they're starting to revise that. It'll be interesting to see when the new report comes out. Of course, um, methane is coming out in ever greater amounts. The, the amount in the atmosphere, the global, the concentration of methane in the atmosphere is increasing. So this is a good, um, this is an apt cartoon. Um, if you go, so this is uh, Sam Carana's uh, site um, I'll give a plug. Sam Carana, Arctic News, Google it. Lots of stuff on the Arctic, lots of stuff on methane. I'm just going to give an example of a, some recent work that there, there's, there's, if you have frozen, if you have permafrost and you thaw out the permafrost, okay, it's, permafrost is frozen ground. It's ground that has remained frozen for at least two years. It may or may not have water content. Okay, if there's no water, then it's just frozen ground. But generally there's some water, um, there's some ice in the permafrost. And when you thaw that ice, it turns into water, the volume, uh, the water runs off and you get a collapse of the land, for example. You can get, or a sinkhole, and then that often will fill with water and you get a lake. So this is a case of a lake where that happened, a thermokarst lake. And look at this, the methane is bubbling out from this lake. Huge amounts of methane are bubbling out. And uh, it turns out that this methane is, is composed of, these are some of the lakes in Alaska that are being looked at. And uh, the, uh, okay, so, so basically this work shows that, you know, the Arctic is rapidly changing. And becoming a methane source. The last thing is if you google AC Arctic Climate Impact Assessment Report you can see how it affects biology, tundra, things